Okay, so now we are on section 4.4. We're going to be talking about the general equilibrium of this model. General equilibrium. What's the general equilibrium? Well, basically, what we're going to be doing with this general equilibrium, the reason we care about it, is that we're going to get all of our first order conditions. We're going to write out some of the other equations that explain the setup of the model, the setup of the problem, and it's going to define the entire economic system. Basically, if you remember the, uh, the phone commercials, the guy's got his phone, it's like, hey, I wonder if I could do this. And that creepy guy's like, hey, there's an app for that. Well, instead of an app for that, there's an equation for this. What are the equations? Well, we're going to list the equations. the entire economy. That's what we want to do. All right, when we think general equilibrium, we're thinking equilibrium across multiple markets. But it's not even equilibrium across multiple markets, it's actually equilibrium across all markets. All right, we've got consumption markets, we've got capital markets, we want those guys to clear. We need an equation to make sure that the demand for consumption and that capital markets, the demand for capital markets won't be exceeding the resource constraint. So we're going to need to include the resource constraint. We're going to need to include the Euler equation. We're going to need to include the law of motion of capital. And we're going to need to include the production function. By doing that, by including all of those equations, we close our model out. That's our Euler equation. This is going to describe how the household wants to save or consume. So that's our consumption savings decisions right there. And so this is how we're going to choose to consume over time. That's going to be the investment flow. The law of motion of capital, the flow of capital, is going to describe the way capital is evolving over time, which is going to determine how we want to consume or save. So we need to describe how production is playing into this model, the role that production plays in the model. We need to figure that out. So we need to have an equation for production, so we got that. 
All right, but then what we also need to do is we need to set up a condition or a constraint really to make sure that what we're consuming and what we're investing is not exceeding what we're producing. Right, so ultimately what I really need to do is I need to tie this guy, this guy, and this guy all down to make sure that they're not exceeding one side or the other. Right, to make sure that the sum of consumption and investment is not exceeding what's being produced. Hence why it's called a resource constraint. This is our general equilibrium. If this is rephrase, this is our general equilibrium if we are dealing with a deterministic or non stochastic dynamic general equilibrium. If this were stochastic, on the other hand, we would have to have a little bit more stuff. What's the stuff that we would need if we had a stochastic process in here? Well, what I would need is something to actually describe what that stochastic process is. I would need an equation for that stochastic process. What is a stochastic process anyways? Well, it's a process that has ultimately two components. There's a deterministic component, and then there's the stochastic component. The deterministic component is what we know. So what is going to happen, we can predict it's going to happen from one day to the next, to the next, to the next. The stochastic component is going to be the, the movement around that. So if we were looking at a trend line, and I'll call this variable y, and that is a trend line. So it's a trend that Y is following over some amount of time, right? This line is deterministic. It's deterministic because we know what it's going to be. If I were to tell you at T equals 1 or T equals 2 or T equals 1,000, I can tell you what it's going to be because there's that deterministic component to this process. Stochastic process will bounce around that deterministic part and it's unpredictable, it's random. Now, random doesn't mean arbitrary in this case. Random just means it's subject to the laws of probability. There's a probabilistic nature to this if this is a stochastic system that we're looking at. Now, I'm bastardizing stuff in this course to make sure that what you're really solving is nothing more than a deterministic system, but then we can use it for stochastic inference later on. Right, but this would be our general equilibrium. I've got something to describe my flow of consumption and savings. I've got an equation that describes how capital evolves based on how capital evolves, if we see we've got this 1 minus delta in the investment flow equation, well that 1 minus delta also shows up in my consumption savings equation. Right? Delta is an exogenous variable in this investment equation. Right? Investment's endogenous, kt plus 1 and kt are endogenous, but depreciation on the other hand isn't. It's an exogenous component. Right, so that exogenous component is going to be determining how the endogenous variables here behave, just like it's going to be determining how the endogenous variables here behave. So if this guy alters investment, this guy is going to alter how much we consume today and how much we consume tomorrow. So by determining what the flow of investment is and what the flow of consumption is, Right? We're going to need to know what's actually being produced, and we're going to need to make sure that every single period, what we consume and what we invest is not going to exceed what's being produced. So before in the solo model, I said output split between consumption and investment. 
A better way to think of it is that the sum of consumption and investment can never exceed production. Because without this equation here, we just got this. If there's no way to tie consumption and investment together, well, we're going to run into an indeterminacy problem. Because even though we'll know what production is, if there's nothing to tie consumption and investment to production, right, we've got no real solution. There's no unique solution to the system of equations. But if I throw a resource constraint in there, it ties consumption and investment to production and it guarantees that I will in fact have a unique solution. So this is our general equilibrium. 